Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Sorry, we're a little bit late. This is a panel called Data Agency, Individual or Shared. I'm joined today by Kalia Young, Nick Vincent, and Matt Pruitt. Joined today we're going to be by... talking about managing and protecting data against centralized power of digital networks. I'm first going to introduce the speakers, and then they're going to each speak a little bit about what they're working on and why this is important to them and us, their opinions. And then we're gonna have a discussion. So Kalia Young, also known as Identity Woman, has spent the last 15 years working to bring about the creation of a new layer of the internet for people based on open standards. She co-founded the Internet Identity Workshop, which was held a few months ago, most recently. And it was also profiled very recently in Mario UK. In 2017, she graduated in the, first, the very first cohort from UT Austin's iSchool with a master's of science in identity management and security. Her master's thesis, The Domains of Identity, a Framework for Understanding Identity Systems in Contemporary Society, is being published this month by Anthem Press. In 2019, she traveled to India for two months as a New America India US Public Interest Technology Fellow to study ADHA, their national identity system. She co-founded Human First Tech with Shireen Mitchell, a project fo focused on creating space for diverse voices and building a more inclusive industry. In 2012, she, re she was recognized excuse me, as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum and Fast Company named her as one of the most influential women in tech in 2019. She consults with governments, NGOs, startups, and enterprises on de decentralized identity technologies. And we have Nick Vincent, who is a PhD student in Northwestern University's Technology and Social Behavior Program, and is part of the People, Space, and Algorithms Research Group. His broad research interests include human-computer human interaction, human-centered machine learning, and social computing. His research focuses on studying the relationships between human-generated data and computing technologies to mitigate negative impacts of these technologies. Sorry, I have to take a breath. <laughs> His work relates to concepts such as dig data dignity, data as labor, data leverage, and data dividends. And we have Matt Pruitt, who many of you will know. Matt is Radical Exchange Foundation's president, a writer and blockchain industry advisor, and a former plaintiff side, plaintiff side antitrust and consumer action litigator and federal law clerk. I'm Jennifer Marone, I'll be the mo moderator. I'm CEO of uh, Radical Exchange Foundation. I'm an artist and also a filmmaker. And so to kick this off, who would like to go first? Kalia, you, um, let me go to my question. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit, you've been focused very much on sovereign, self-sovereign identity. Could you tell us more about that and how it fits in also with um, ideas of intersectional identity? Sure. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so the the self sovereign identity. Um, so I think there, it's important to understand there are some folks who use the term and talk about big ideas associated with it, and then there's a sort of practical side of what that means in terms of building real technologies and open standards. And my work really focuses much more on the practical side of supporting the technologists working on developing the open standards. Um, so I'll describe a little bit about what it will practically mean if when we get to SSI, which I think we're on the cusp of, which is that individuals can have an anchor, a, a digital identifier in which to enter and engage with digital space that they own and control that isn't given to them by another entity. So one of the challenges that we have in the current digital world is that our identifiers are assigned to us by other entities. So when we are in Twitter, we have a handle, but it's under Twitter. And when we're at Gmail, we have a handle under Gmail. When we're at Facebook, we have a, a name, but it's under Facebook's namespace. So until we actually enable people to own their own digital node, their own digital representation of themselves without another entity assigning it to them, we can't really shift the power paradigm that's going on with tech. So that's one piece of it. And another is this new open standard called verifiable credentials that allows any entity to package up information 
and share it with the individual. And then the individual can in turn share it with whoever they choose to. And, and it means that we could, um, and, and it's all based on a, it's a data format and it's an open standard. So it has a, a wide range of expressive capacity. So it could be used by all sorts of innovative people and companies to really change change how they're interacting with their customers or their users or their community members, however we want to frame folks who are connecting to each other on the internet. And, um, and that in terms of this conversation about data ownership, how do you know where the data came from? Unless it's signed, it's really hard to have provenance because I could take, get data, put it in my data store, change it all around and then share it. But why should the entity I'm sharing with it believe it unless it's packaged up and signed in a way that's believable. So we're trying to, there's several things that come out of this technology that I think really enable new paradigms that, that we're discussing here about how data is exchanged and given back to people in empowering ways. Thanks. Actually, let's maybe step back. First, I wanna get, um kind of set, set the stage a bit of where we all think we are in terms of the data problem. Do you want to each take a take like a little statement moment to, to express how you feel like the situation is right now and the biggest hurdle, the biggest problem we face? Who, wants, who would like to go first? Sure, I, <laughs> Okay. Oh, or yeah. No, no, I was going to say maybe Kalia, no, no, that's no, what no. you I'll think let, is. Let someone else go. Okay. okay. Um, sure. So I guess the kind of my, my take on what, what's, the, what's the problem or what's the, uh, the concerning future that we might want to be a little worried about is that the, the status quo for people using online platforms and, and technologies from big tech companies right now is that you can go online and get a lot of free services. But the reason is because you're generating data all the time, or one of the reasons is that you're generating data all the time that's used for a lot of things, like primarily, uh, tar well, targeted advertising is a big one. That's the primary, a primary revenue source for a lot of tech companies, but it's not the only thing. There's a lot of other types of data that are used to fuel all sorts of technologies. Um, and right now it's really, uh, it's really opaque. It's hard to know how much value each individual is generating. It's hard to know even how many companies might be generating from a particular action that you took. Um, but this is really exciting. And so there's this idea that we maybe should th be thinking of data as labor. Um, and I think that's not, that's pretty familiar to, to this crowd or to folks who've been uh, following radical exchange for a while. Um, and I, I guess a prob the, the problem would be what if we can never change that status quo and we just kind of go on forever with uh, large companies and large firms accumulating more power, basically setting all the rules of engagement for, for data and uh, not really allowing individual people or groups of people to to make choices, getting to the theme of this individual versus shared. Um, and yeah, I, I guess my research is kind of exploring some ways that we might avoid that particular future. And I can talk more about that later, but that's the short version. Uh. Thanks. Matt, do you want to go? Sure, yeah, I think I think what I uh, what I have to say about this is quite similar to what, what Nick said. Um, I mean, I've, I've spent much of the last two years uh, working with, um, Lots of great researchers, including Nick and and Kalia, on um, on this problem of uh, of essentially, uh, as as Nick was saying, uh, you know, the, the the way that I look at it is that you know the data that we are all creating through our um, through our living our lives on devices and interacting with each other on digital networks is this kind of vast interconnected collective um, collective asset that we're all engaged in uh, in creating. But when we try to sort of uh, um, get value from it or get control of it uh, as individuals, we're faced with this sort of enormous uh, failure of coordination so that um, so that you know none of us really have 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 traction on um, uh, on this asset, and we're, so we're not we're really not enjoying um, very much of the benefit of it. By contrast, um, the 
you know, private companies that own the networks through which we're interacting are in a position to, um, to extract an enormous amount of, of value from it and to, an ex and to exert an enormous amount of control um, over us um, through that, through the way that they're positioned. Um, and uh, th so this is, this is a problem that worries me enormously and that I don't think will fix itself. And in fact, it's likely to just to, to get worse if left alone. And, um, uh, uh, and so that, you know, I've been, um, yeah, engaged in, in trying to come up with different, different solutions to this. And Kalia, do you have a, a specific? I, have thoughts. I mean, I agree with um, both of the, the other panelists and I, <clears throat> I also, um, one of the things that has surfaced is this tension, right, between the individual and their own personal ownership and sort of these, um, the potential, well, one, right now it's like the collective of whatever the company pulls together, but, you know, how do individuals aggregate their data and their power together to change this? And, you know, I, I think it's a harder it's easy to talk about, and I think it's going to be harder technically to implement. Um, but I think until we get data ownership for people and get that infrastructure built, we can't do collective ownership really. So it's it, you know how do we how do we how do we create the tools for people to really get their data back or I don't know if they ever had it, but to sort of rewire these systems and then move to, and how do they act together with their newly found individual control and empowerment? So I, <clears throat> I don't know if um, anybody in the audience is familiar with my project that I had started. At, it was a protest art piece. Um, back in 2013. And it was where I was coming up against um, looking at after Snowden's revelations, seeing, um, you know, that this data was becoming very uh, valuable. And that corporations at the time, there was no GDPR, were the only entities that could do anything to control or protect their data. And so I incorporated my identity and used that legal container to put my data and try. It was a provocation though as well. It wasn't that I really thought that was the way um, everybody should do it. And that it was a little bit more looking at data as from the individual level, everything that came from me or was about me and to try and show how futile that was to try and get control and ownership over that especially against these big tech giants. Um, and, you know, you'd be litigating everywhere. It wouldn't, <laughs> unless you're as strong and powerful as them, it just doesn't work. And so the eventual kind of conclusion in that project, which isn't often seen, I think, is that it ultimately has to come from a collective, uh, like a commons or a cooperative, or we have to like put it together. And that's the only reason, the only way it's really valuable as Nick, you've written a lot about and, and Matt as well in terms of um, looking at the economic aspect of it. So I guess I don't disagree with you, Kalia, about the, I think the awareness needs to come that we see it as valuable and we kind of own the fact that it should belong to, or belong, I think is the wrong word. It's like, it should be used <laughs> for the public good. And we all have a stake in that. And we all have like conscious contribution or is, you know, what's passive, what's active, what's intentional, unintentional. And then like, what is, um, what is worth doing and how to have control over that. And I say, I don't know if that, might be a good way in terms of this individual or shared, <clears throat> a good way to kind of get the conversation going. And Nick, I know you've done a lot of work in this field. Um, 
do you have anything that that sparks in your mind? Uh, yeah, so I guess I had a couple of thoughts that I that I thought would be pretty interesting for this debate. Um, so one like one way that I've thought about approaching the individual versus shared question is is through the lens of like specific machine learning technologies. So a uh, I think one question that arises from the whole uh, kind of area of thinking around data as labor and data dignity and uh, the idea that maybe we should be remunerated for data or have more agency over data um, is this question of well how much does my data matter. Um, so I, I might tell you, oh, well, your, your, all your data is being used to fuel these amazing AI technologies and search engines and recommendations and ad targeting and facial recognition and maybe even self-driving cars soon. Um, and you'd say, okay, well, how, how much do, does, do I matter? So that kind of translates to this very uh, answerable question, which is actually, you have some data set, there's a thousand people who all contributed their data to, let's say, a recommender system, and then you delete one person's data and, and retrain it from scratch. So it's kind of like creating this counterfactual universe where that individual no longer contributed their data, and you compare those to it. And, and that uh, machine learning like research, the kind of research methods that folks in machine learning use is perfectly set up to answer that question. Um, and actually this, this whole question of uh, what are computational techniques for finding the value of an individual's contribution to uh, uh, data or a particular machine learning task was really reinvigorated in, in 2017, the best paper award at the NeurIPS conference, which is one of the, the, one of the top most prestigious machine learning conferences was about answering this question in a really computationally efficient manner. And since then, uh, there's been a ton, ton of work kind of following off of that. Interestingly, it kind of was building off some stats work from the 80s, uh, but kind of reinvigorated it. And uh, basically the point is that we can do this now. There, there's cool techniques for doing this. So you can imagine doing this at scale, trying to figure out how much the value of a lot of individuals' uh, data contributions are to specific machine learning technologies. But at the end of the day, and again, this won't be surprising to anyone in machine learning, basically no individual actually matters, right? So any system that has 100,000 users contributing data to it, none of the individuals actually make a really, really a noticeable difference uh, in like in any sort of aggregate performance measures. So that's really interesting to me because uh, that's kind of like a, if you just look at this data, if you look at these values, these like these credit values, if you will, um, empirically, it's just not, basically there's just no way to really shift the needle on these machine learning systems without collective power. So, so to me, that kind of suggests this uh, may be obvious to some conclusion, but maybe not that any sort of uh, kind of movement or attempt to exert power, what we've called in our research data leverage, um, really requires collective action. It, it has to be a collective effort because machine learning doesn't care about individuals. That's both like kind of the blessing and the curse of machine learning and I guess AI more broadly. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of one, one thought that I wanted to share along those lines. So I'll, I'll share that I think this question of <clears throat> how we talk about it is, is important, right, in terms of is it about the term ownership or is it about the term um, rights and responsibilities and resource management. So one of the one of the folks in, in my community, Scott David, has proposed that we look at natural resource law which manages, you know, how we how we address like rivers and the air um, as potentially a uh, uh, one of the 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 legal frameworks for thinking about data that's really quite different than an ownership frame, which is anchored in physical property and the fact that, you know, if I have my my hair barrette and I give it to you, Jennifer it's no longer mine. But if this was a data representation of this and I gave it to you, we both could have a data representation that there's this difference between atoms and bits and then bits and, and how we think about managing them, we need to not ground it in conventional property law. But I, I'm gonna <laughs> toss them all over to Matt because he's the lawyer on the panel to, to maybe um, take it from there. Well, I think that what you're getting at, Kalia, is really important. And I, what strikes me is that in in a, a lot of um, in a lot of conversations about data, even including with people who think about it a lot and think about it professionally, there are very very easy ways to misunderstand each other and to talk past each other. Um, it's it's incredibly difficult and abstract idea and and I think that one of the um, one of the 
ways that we often talk past each other is is uh, is in this idea of uh, my data or or you know j just the just the idea just the concept of like what it means for data to be mine. So in other words, you know, one way of thinking about what that means is like that is that there's there's certain information that I have under my control that I can contribute to a system because it's under my control. And so just in just in ordinary English speech, you could say that's my data. Uh, but then there's another way of understanding. Uh, there's another you can also look sort of deeper and ask, like, where did that data come from? Like, whose whose data is that really? So if if I, so for example, if I have data under my control, it may not all be about me. It may be about other people. And in fact, if you take a magnifying glass to all of the all of the information that I have that I might even consider to be very much about me, it also is about other people because the facts of my life are inextricable from the facts from facts about other people's lives. Um, so, and, and this might seem this might seem really abstract, or it might seem like I'm starting to get into some sort of like edge case of like you know, you know, most data most data can clearly be understood as either mine or yours or 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 Nick's or Jen's, right? But you know, maybe there's a few cases where it sort of overlaps, like. I actually think that the that the it sort of turtles all the way down. This is a this rabbit hole goes pretty deep, and in in fact, like al almost everything you can meaningfully say about me isn't only about me, um, and, and this this is because I form my identity in a social context. I mean, it's it's that's it, it, at the end of the day, it, it's it, that it's it's just based on that simple fact that you know whatever um, the, 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 the preferences I have, the things I like to do, the things I like to buy, the relationships that I've formed, all of these are, are unimaginable without the social context uh, from which I, you know, in which I find myself and, and which has formed me. Um, and, um, and so I think that you know when we talk about when we talk about collective control over data and the need for sort of shared control over data, you know one one way of one way of understanding that is that well we'll just never have any leverage over over uh, Google um, if we don't band together. So that's why we need to band together, right? And that's true. But then the other the other side of the coin, which is also true is that on some sort of moral level, we need to have sh shared control over, uh, over information because uh, whatever control we exert over our information uh, has consequences for other people. Um, so, so in other words, you know, you know, whenever I disclose things about myself, I'm also disclosing things about others, which means that, um, which means that it's, not only about, it's not only about power, it is about power, but it's not only about power. When I, um, you know, share data or you know try to try to control it or try to get something in exchange for it, it's also about responsibility. So that you know, if I'm going to share a bunch of information from, about my, you know, quote unquote about myself, or uh, you know, to put it more accurately, share a bunch of inf information under my control, that's going to have consequences for people around me, and. Uh, and on a, on a on a moral level, as well as on sort of a power dynamics level, I ought to be making a decision with them, with others, um, about what I do with with you know the trove of data that's on my you know hard drive and on my phone and whatever. We are the authors of each other, right? And um, the 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 African concept of Ubuntu. Like I am because we are, and you know. Yeah, totally. I mean, this this stuff starts to sound a little bit, you know, far out or something, but it's not. It's just it. You know, I we, like we need to. I think that this this little sort of decentering of 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 our thinking about about uh, who we are and what is ours is needed to get a clear understanding of what's going on in the data economy and what, um, and, and what, what data 
just ontologically like uh, is so. I think I have. There's a there's a question from Carl. I wonder if this is Carl Kemmer um, for you, Matt. And this relates to what you're saying. I think like a real life question about digital passports. Who would you say owns the data on that passport? The individual or the issuer of the passport or both? I would add that probably it's part of being a citizenry. So does he mean like issue. literal passports? I think so. Okay. So who, who controls the information on the passport? Who owns it? Who owns it? Because technically so physical other, passport, to, just so we're clear about part of the context, technically physical passports are owned by the sovereign that issues them, not the person. Yeah, this is digital passports. Right. But yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It says it says in the passport you do not like this is this belongs to the US government or yeah. the nation that that's issued it. But I think there's a question in there in terms of like there's a there's a hole missing. Like there's a whole uh, citizenry. The public it doesn't belong to the public. The information in that passport is basically given to us. Does that kind of feature into what you're saying, Matt? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, if you, I think that if you think about the, uh, you know, I can talk about a digital passport in a second, but even if you just think about a traditional passport uh, issued by the, by the government, the, if you think about the information in that passport, it's, it's better understood not as something that is mine, but as something that is, but as a connection between between me and the government that issued it and the community, the democratic community that may or may not have authority over that government. And the, you know, the, the information, you know, something like, well, I mean, you know, my, my name is also the name of other people in my family. You know, my surname is is happens to be also my father's surname. Um, you know, my uh, my my date of you know, if you know my date of birth, you know, you might be able to guess you know some passwords of my cousins or something like that. Like you know, so all of the you know all of the information that um, is is on that passport uh, is connected to my, my community in, in, in various ways. And if or it connects me to my community in various ways, and it, in a digital passport, a properly constructed digital passport, properly conceived digital passport would do the same thing, would, uh, would, would link me to, uh, to a context within the, within the digital world. There's a question here that, because um, we're starting to get them in from the, the crowd, the audience, that I was going to ask anyway, but I was going to ask in a different way uh, so that I didn't, uh, one would be like, how do you each categorize where, what is happening with data then? Because if, Kalia, you think of data, like we need to own it first um, or it's shared, do you see it? And now I'm going to lead with the, the question. Do you still see it as a form of rent seeking? If if the identity, so clear. Oh, I'm not quite following. <laughs> so if in terms of our, how we think about it, like if it's resource like river, or right. if it's capital or an like an asset, or yeah. if it's intellectual property or just property in general. Yeah. Um, and there's the economy that we're not, or the marketplace, I guess you could say, yeah. that we're not part of. Would you each still consider it, I mean, I do, as a form of rent seeking that's happening? Yeah. Well, and I think it's a rent seeking that isn't the current structure of what's going on is a rent seeking that's really exploitive and sort of driving bad social outcomes. 
So it's, it's even, it's like, it's gone to the point of like being maybe something that was good or neutral to something that's actually causing societal harms. And now we have to <laughs> run faster to fix it. But I mean, folks have been warning about these outcomes for a long time. And I don't know that we've been listening. So, I mean, I think that a powerful way of, uh, of understanding what rent seeking is, um, is, uh, is that, you know, rent is sort of, um, rent is sort of like scraping off the surplus value that are created by network effects. And I, th I think it's a, a fairly general way of understanding what many different kinds of rent are. And I, and I think this is a, a, a good way of understanding what, um, what sort of, uh, uh, you know, data exploiting platform type businesses are doing there, you know, they, because they, they are facilitating the creation of lots of interconnections and, and links and interactions between, uh, between people. So they're sort of facilitating this growth of this of a, of a huge network of connections um, between people. And then they're sort of using their, their privileged access to that network um, to, uh, uh, for, for, for profit and, and control. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, sh you know, sh short answer, I, I think that it's, it, it, uh, it is a form of, of rent seeking and, uh, and these, the kinds of, the kinds of uh, collective bargaining type solutions um, and uh, data leverage type solutions that Nick was alluding to these, you know, ideas for sort of rebalancing the power dynamic within these networks are are aimed at uh, um, uh, redistributing that rent or that or that control or that sort of privileged control over the network. Maybe. Um... Matt, you've, well, you and Kalia both worked on, so what, what was it, like a year ago, you got together, we got together some people and uh, split up into two groups, one working on the Data Freedom Act that was released some time ago and which has, um, I think in the leaked version of the Data Governance Act that came out recently in the UK was inspired, that was inspired by the work that you guys did um, the more in the EU, in the EU, sorry, in the more recent version, the like really publicized version, um, the not leaked version changed quite a bit. And I think it might be a good time because you're talking about collective bargaining and, you know, these data agreements and, um, it'd probably be a good moment to talk about that. And then Nick, if you could talk, cause you went into the other group that was looking at data tax, data dividend, and if you could speak about those and try and if you can speak about them in like a real life example sort of way, if, if you can manage, or you could just tell us about what, what was in each of those. So Matt, do you wanna keep going? Sure, so, thread? so I, th I think that um, the, the data, the data Freedom Act white paper sort of policy proposal that we worked on. Um, I will, I'll describe that briefly and then I'll, I'll hand it to Nick to talk about uh, the data dividends work, I think. Um, and, but the, the Data Freedom Act proposal is basically a proposal to create a, to create a regulatory environment that would facilitate data intermediaries um, arising and acting as sort of collective bargaining representatives for um, for for people um, in, in their in their digital lives, and the the way of I think that the the best way of seeing the kind of vision behind the Data Freedom Act is to is to imagine the sort of the um, the end game or the consequences of it. So, if, if something like the Data Freedom Act were uh, um, were in place. What would happen would would be that platform businesses uh, like your your Facebook or whatever, um, in in order to in order to use um, the data of their users, in order to sort of ex, you know exploit the 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 vast 
amounts of, of user data that, that they have access to, they would need to strike deals with, um, with these intermediaries, these sort of specialized um, uh, regulated uh, collective bargaining agents who you know, owe fiduciary duties to, to the users. So you know, Facebook would be sort of sitting across the table from, uh, from an agent representing many, many users at once when they, um, uh, in order to get the, the, um, the, 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 the privilege of, of, of exploiting that data. And so that, you know, that collective bargaining agent could, could negotiate um, uh, things like, uh, like rules about what sorts of algorithms uh, Facebook would be able to, um, to feed the data uh, into what sorts of products they'd be able to push to the users, um, uh, potentially also negotiate things like, um, uh, like, like revenue sharing or, 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 or payment so that, you know, uh, the, you know, the vast amount of revenue and potential, you know, the vast amount of, of profit and value that's in Facebook's shares and all that would be, uh, would be split not you know between between Facebook and its users basically, um, uh, so it's a um, you know but in order for that to happen there would need to be you know we would need to sort of set up a a a, a, a reasonably complex infrastructure of of regulated um, collective bargaining entities that would be you know um, uh, acting on behalf of of users, um, uh, and uh, um, the Data Freedom Act basically thinks through uh, all of all of the you know kind of thinks from from A to Z in terms of you know what what would we really need to get from from where we are now where we're all just kind of clicking check boxes and uh, get giving away data on a on an individualized uncoordinated basis to a world in which we were um, uh, we were acting on behalf of intermediaries that could handle the complexity for us and, and also exert our, our uh, collective, uh, collective power. Nick, do you want to? Well, okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'll swing it over. So I'll just start by saying that what I'm going to describe is very much complementary to that. And this is not like a either or situation or, or competing proposals at all. Um, so the idea behind the data dividends report is that it was specifically uh, inspired by the 2019 California state of the state speech in which the governor basically said, I'm interested in doing something called a data dividend that would be, uh, in some sense, give people value for their data. It was a couple, just like two lines. So we're kind of interpolating a little bit there. And we basically a group, a huge group, uh, tons of people kind of filtering in and out, lots of just like feedback, really a great collective effort. Um, wanted to answer the question, if California was going to implement something called a data dividend tomorrow, what would it look like? And they have to be able to do it tomorrow. We also wanted to think about how would it adapt in the long term and what would maybe the fancy, the you know, science fiction version look like, what would the version in five years look like, but we really wanted it to work tomorrow. And so what we came up with was um, that basically there's kind of like four components. So the government would, uh, the state government would impose a uh, data dependent, some sort of data dependence tax. So basically a tax that says the more, the larger the network of people that you're exploiting their data, the more you pay into this fund. Um, and then rather than trying to pay people individual uh, paychecks, so a huge criticism of this data, there's a, there's a lot of criticisms of, criticisms of the data dividends idea. I think we have some pretty good responses to the main ones. I should also add, if anyone wants to read about this, uh, datadividends.org. We have a nice little website. There's a short summary version and there's an older draft on there and we're gonna have a new draft coming out soon. Uh, so lots of exciting stuff that has some updates, especially because this is a really uh, active area of discussion and, and regulation even. Um, and so back to what's, what's, what's going on in our report. So we say data dependence tax. Um, we say, don't try to give people paychecks. If, we're, if you're gonna institute it tomorrow, uh, one of the big criticisms is that, okay, great. Everyone gets a $20 paycheck um, because of their contributions to Facebook's targeted advertising algorithms. That probably won't create wide-scale societal change or immediately, um, you know, create uh, solutions to the to the many harms that we're worried about. Uh, so instead, we basically suggest, in the short term, do targeted things. So fund public goods, uh, fund infrastructure, 
particularly maybe infrastructure that uh, allows for more access to, to the benefits of uh, digital technology and also fund things that have long-term benefits like uh, baby bonds is one of the ideas we floated. So we don't have, we're not married to any specific idea. We lay out a bunch, but basically it's, it's public goods, not individual paychecks if you're gonna do it tomorrow. Now, if you're gonna do it in 10 years, maybe in 10 years, not everyone's not getting $20 for their Facebook anymore. They're getting a lot more money. And that's where the, the paycheck idea might come in. But starting tomorrow, don't do it. Um, we've also, we've used some of those techniques from, or so my lab um, has done some research using techniques from the machine learning literature to answer this question of, okay, what if we tried to calculate exactly how, how much did you contribute to the algorithm? How much did you contribute? Or sorry, to the machine learning technology broadly construed? How much did you contribute? and use those uh, scores to assign people money. And basically it's really easy if you do that, which sounds appealing. It sounds really exciting if you're a machine learning researcher. It's like, wow, that's so cool. I really wanna do that. It's really easy to create uh, really unequal outcomes and actually potentially uh, exacerbate inequality even more. Uh, so we don't really suggest that either. Uh, and then finally, we, we recommend the creation of a data relations board that would basically uh, help to conduct research and kind of adjudicate the many, there's gonna be a lot of questions that arise uh, in, this, in this sphere. And that also could conduct research that kind of looks to make things like data unions or uh, other cooperative entities more possible uh, and, and do things like support uh, collective bargaining via data and, and other things like that. So these kind of segue into each other. I guess our, our version, the data dividends report is really focused on something that could happen tomorrow. Um, and not necessarily, and maybe the having cooperative and collectives is more of a long-term solution. Yeah, and I think, I think the, the data dividends report um, does a uh, takes a very rigorous look at this idea of uh, network rents in connection with data, basically, and um, and suggests um, suggests uh, um, a really good way of of counterbalancing the fact that essentially, if you you know if you control larger networks. Uh, of of people through like a digital platform, you're in position to um, to exact a, uh, a a more harmful rent uh, from the public, and um, the 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 data dividends report um, gets at that problem uh, really uh, really elegantly. Um, I want to um, share the fact that we actually had um, somebody running for Congress on a platform around this. James Felton Keith, um, and and he, I, I mean, when I I wasn't really following fully the arguments he was making, and then all of a sudden it clicked, and he was like, "Look, the all all large companies today, not just the ones that are quote unquote digital, but think about like <clears throat> you know like Amazon or even GE or like just." You know, the Fortune 500 is making money off of data because it's using it to help it run. And he's like, we should be taxing those companies because they're using our data. Like, it's a really different frame on why taxation is important and like the reasoning behind it and how to feed that back into society because they're using our data to run their, you know, run their businesses and to make money. They should be taxed because it's our data, and it should come back to us to help, you know, help build society. Yeah, so I agree completely with what James Felton Keith and Kalia just said. Um, but one thing that comes to mind, especially with the data dividends, so that's a state solution. There are several things, and I'm sure you've looked at all of these and have been confronted with these uh, criticisms. What if What's going to make the companies do that? What if we're not on you? I think, Kalia, are you also in California? Yeah, so three of you are in California. You would benefit other in public. Or no, you're not in California, Nick, sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm from California. But you're from I'm California. California. <laughs> so whether you would get, uh, would you get a data dividend uh, based on that? Or you could go back and use the public services that it would be feeding into. What about um, a you like, if I'm on Facebook or using Amazon or something, and because all these companies, Amazon's not there, but Facebook, let's use Facebook because they're located in California. So is the state going to make them pay the dividends because just to stay in California, would they move somewhere else? What about me in New Jersey? Is my data 
do you get the value of that? Does my data contribution go to your public infrastructure um, or to your data dividend check? You know, like what happens there? How do, is it something where it's like California is gonna take the lead in doing this and then others will follow suit or will there be just like tax havens where the company is gonna move to the Bahamas because they don't care and you don't, they're not gonna make you pay these data dividends. Like how does that? Yeah, so actually we have, we have answers for both of those. Um, and uh, I'll do the short version. So the, the best version is, is in the report um, and I can't recite it from memory, but the short version is that we wanna lean on basically existing experts in solving these two problems. So there's kind of two problems here. Problem one is how do we know um, if you're kind of in the state, how do you know if you count as a California resident? And then problem two is what do we do? Like obviously every corporation is gonna do their best to pay as little tax as possible. So what, how do we deal with that? And on the tax front, there's actually, uh, there's kind of a, a nice thing going on, which is that the some of the latest research in kind of addressing tax havens suggests this uh, like global sales apportioned tax approach. That's actually what California does for the corporate income tax already. And so there's probably, because this would be new, this data dependence tax would be new, there's a good opportunity to kind of implement the cutting edge and, uh, and even experiment a little bit because, because it's new. And so basically we say, look to those experts in, in that field and kind of uh, uh, experiment a little bit and, and uh, take that approach. In terms of the, do you count as a California resident? How do I know? So I'm a company, how do I count up the number of people about whom I have data? And we basically say, look to the, um, the California specific regula regulations of the CCPA, um, which basically has, there are pretty uh, detailed, uh, you know, laid out definitions of what it, what it means to have data about people. And there'll, be, there'll definitely be some uh, conflicts and people are gonna try to, to break the rules. And that's where the data relations board would basically need to come in and adjudicate and be an arbiter. But uh, basically we, we do think that there's, there does exist uh, decent regulation and examples and, and really cutting edge research in, in tax and in tax law um, that would be able to address these concerns. And we don't, obviously, we don't think we're, it's gonna, not gonna be perfect at first, but uh, it'll definitely, it'll probably be better than the status quo. And it's something that can continue to be iterated on as well. I think I would add to that that there's, um, there's always a, when you're trying to sort of uh, think through a, a policy problem, there's, there's always a tension between uh, local and global. Um, and especially when you're dealing with, you know, a, a, something as inherently interconnected as data. So that, you know, if you think too uh, too locally, then then the um, you know the worry is either that there won't be enough traction on the problem at this local level, or that it will create some kind of problematic uh, division between this locality and the rest of the uh, of the society. Um, and if you think too uh, too globally, then the problem becomes. Is this feasible, or is it even responsible to to try uh, a new policy on on this uh, you know gigantic global global level? You know, whereas on the more local level, it's it's like a, you you know it's there's an argument you made that you're experimenting with policy, and if it works, then you, then it can be duplicated in other places. So there's there's always this local global um, uh, tension, and I think that uh, m my view is that. Um, that we have to start somewhere, um, and it's uh, it's it's okay to uh, you know it it it's it's very hard to answer uh, the question of what what the optimal place to start is, but um, uh, but but starting with uh, with a really well thought through uh, new policy on a local level is likely to be a step in the right direction. It's also likely to be a step in the right direction to uh, to take uh, cautious, responsible steps towards. Um, towards smart policies at a um, at, at like a, a national or or, or um, you know more more global type level. So um, yeah, there's just always this sort of on the one hand, on the other hand, with that. Talia, did you want to say something? No. Well, I, I know Nick, you brought up also data poisoning and data strike or striking as well. 
recently on another call. So I'm, I'm just imagining uh, scenarios where, um, again, let's think of Facebook and you have some people striking, organizing to strike, and you have other people poisoning. And then you have some people, you know, say if this, the data dividend data tax was passed and it was operating some people, um, you know, receiving the benefits. So is that, is that part of the problem with thinking about data as an individual, like we should have individual agency um, that that could possibly happen if we think about it that way. It's like, I'm getting something or I'm not getting something and somebody else is, I'm gonna strike Facebook and it disrupts the whole system. Is it, maybe talk a little bit about the striking, like what, what you saw with striking and poisoning and if that would be more beneficial in terms of, or is that a pre yeah. a preamble to getting Facebook there? So let, let me just like give a quick background on that. So um, actually some really recent work. So we, this is like a, a topic that's been in our minds for a while. And it's kind of a, a logical extension of just the whole data as labor idea going back to, I'm sure lots of folks in the radical exchange community have maybe had this train of thought as well, that okay, if data is labor, then well, there's a lot of historical ways that labor has um, you know, gained power over, over firms and and uh, industries, and it's one of the, the biggest one of these labor strikes, or and even sometimes sectoral bargaining. But uh, basically, if if you can do a labor strike, well, and data is labor, then can't you do a data strike? That that's kind of the the chain of logic. And uh, more practically, like another simple way to put it is that if I'm giving you my data right now and it's making your AI really good, and I stop giving you my data, or I delete my data, um, or I mess it up and I start lying, well, then your AI is not going to be as good anymore. Um, that's like the the super simple premise. Um, and so some really recent work that I, I've done with uh, colleagues at Northwestern uh, has basically laid out this framework of data leverage. And, and data leverage is, is really kind of, um, on one hand, it's really broad, but on the other hand, it's also kind of nice and simple. So we basically say there's three ways, there's three data levers that uh, an individual or a group, or sorry, it's, it's really in theory an individual, but an, an, no, any individual is gonna have too small of an impact. So a group of people can basically exert leverage over companies that depend on their data to fuel um, any sort of data dependent technology. And so those three levers are data strikes. So that's you either uh, withhold your data or you delete it. So you say, you can't use my data anymore to make your system better. Uh, the second version is data poisoning. And that's where you say, I'm going to basically lie to your system. So maybe I, if I really hate a particular genre of music, I go and I uh, listen to a bunch of songs to try to basically trick that company into like making bad music recommendations to other people. And you can go really crazy on this. This is another area where the machine learning liter literature is rich. And these some just like there's some wild research where people have found really crazy ways to like do pixel level manipulations of images to mess up machine learning systems. And so you can get wild with this. And then the third is conscious data contribution. And this basically says, okay, well, maybe the company is too big or I can't get enough people to do a data strike or data poisoning attack. Um, and so instead, I'm going to basically contribute data to a company that competes with them. And it's kind of like it's a the name is kind of a uh, allusion to like conscious consumerism, which has pros and cons for sure. Um, but so conscious data contribution is especially nice because data is non-rival. I can give my, if there's five new startups that I think are pretty ethical and are doing uh, some, are competing along about some machine learning technology, I can give my data to all five of them. Uh, that, that's, it's pretty easy to do. So those are the, the three data levers. And we basically pr propose that they could be used to exert leverage along a lot of issues. So there's a lot of issues in computing right now. Economic inequality, uh, exacerbated economic inequality is one, but uh, algorithmic systems that kind of reinforce societal biases is, is a huge one um, that there's a lot of like really rich and emerging. It's a, like a very active research area. Um, there's content moderation, uh, debates about what should be moderated, who gets to, who gets to have a say in that. Um, there's environmental concerns that machine learning is going to, as it ramps up more and more, if there's exponential growth in machine learning, it could start to become a serious source of uh, emissions uh, and more and more and more and more. Basically data leverage could be used for any of these things. And one of the things could be a data dividend. So the idea is that a giant, you know, statewide data strike could be used to say, to give Facebook an incentive to support a data dividend or to stop, uh, you know, lobbying against a data dividend law or a new data dependence tax law or something like that. Um, the dynamics after it's passed are really interesting. Um, and so I, I don't actually, I don't have a super concrete answer on that right now. My guess is that it would basically be part of an ongoing conversation. So maybe, there's a data strike to get uh, a statewide data dividend passed. And then some people decide they're going to do a conscious data contribution campaign um, 
to support a company that is like anti-data dividends. That's that's totally possible. There could be definitely some some dialogue and like a multitude of voices exerting data leverage in different ways. And uh, I think that'd be okay. <laughs> yeah, so sorry, that was a pretty dense answer, um, but I just wanted to give that background because I thought it'd be helpful. <laughs> Well, that sounds like a combination between shared and individual action. Uh, yeah, ultimately, I would say that I, I do think that, of course, individuals are, it's choices to participate in these things come down to even individual choices, as is the case with with uh, most collective action. Not all the time, but but a lot of types of collective action uh, come down to individual choices. Um, and so that's that's how I imagine. I think in the near term, all uh, all sorts of like kind of data leverage movements are going to be some combination of shared, shared and uh, individual. And did you, there's one question in the audience that you might have come across, like, would, would it be a situation where each state would offer a new legal form to allow humans to incorporate their digital identity and then the state serves as like the data union? That is possible. So I don't think in our data dividends proposal, we don't really conceptualize the state as being a, a representative in our, in our intermediary in the same sense that it is in the Data Freedom Act. I don't know, maybe maybe Matt and Clea can speak to this better than me. Um, but I think it's a little bit different. But in theory, it could turn out that way. That That is like a possible outcome. I don't think it's the one that we imagined. Is, is that what you all had in mind or? No, I'm, I mean, I'm cute. Not a, that's that's not exactly what I had in mind. Uh, speaking for myself, but I'm curious, like what um, what sort of units uh, uh, of organization do do you envision um, as the units of action in in data leverage? Like, um, so you know, is this sort of a is it like community associations? Is it something like um, the sort of the uh, data trusts? that you know um uh sylvie de la croix and neil lawrence have described in in europe um yeah wh who do you who do you imagine acting uh yes yes and yes so i'm gonna do a hand wave here and say i, I definitely think that there are a lot of possibilities but i'm gonna unhand wave a little bit by giving you some concrete examples of, of things that i really do think are practical and one of the big things we we point out in this data leverage paper is that there's already there are some undercurrents of data leverage already going on. Lots of people, there's a pretty rich literature on people like quitting uh, technology and social media for, for political and uh, protest reasons. And those people like, whether or not they were intending to harm Facebook's ad targeting algorithm, they did. Um, assuming that with the relatively uh, not too controversial assumption that more data equals boost, diminishing boosts in accuracy. Um, so there's already people doing this. Uh, now, to give you some, some concrete examples of like, what are the units of data leverage? So one could be uh, basically following other forms of online collective action. So like things like hashtag activism and kind of using platforms like, like Twitter and Facebook, uh, these online platforms themselves to kind of disseminate a message to say like, hey, everyone, don't use this app for, for two weeks or stop using this particular feature of the app because that feature like really gives them really rich data that's, that's quite good for uh, training a system. So that's one. Another could be local community. So for CDC in particular, conscious data contribution, um, there's a lot of potential for like local communities to rally around. And let, let's say you need a, there's a, a computer vision system that like detects trees would be useful to you. And there's a lot of the trees in your particular area that the place, the geographic region you live um, are underrepresented in existing computer vision data sets. That community could kind of rally around and try to like take pictures and label pictures of trees to give to a company that's specifically going to compete in the computer vision sphere. Um, so there's opportunities to leverage online social networks. There's a lot of opportunities to leverage uh, physical local communities. Um, and then also things like data trust that kind of automate the process are also really promising because no one wants to sit down and say, okay, what are the 20 data leverage movements I'm going to, you know, join today? What, what, I, okay, there's 50 companies who all want my data, which uh, I, I'm going to pick 25, which ones are, am I going to do? Like, no one's going to sit that, you know, do that while they're drinking their morning coffee. Um, and so that's where things like, um, like trust in the intermediaries uh, will, will be really useful. I guess it remains to be seen uh, how, how large those will be. So I, I don't really want to speculate on the particular, uh, the size there, but um, I guess basically I think all three are actually are really plausible. And I'm not just saying that to you know show for my research. So, Kalia, I want to go back to a bit of the self-sovereign identity 
because I'm trying to think about that and square that with all these ideas. Like, can you, can you maybe talk a bit about your ideal direction and how, how you, how you think about it, like the portability, how that would work to have this one unique identifier, I guess. No, 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 there is no one unique identifier. <laughs> That's another misunderstanding. So I think, um, so one piece of our work is, uh, you know, the technologies that are, are on the cusp of sort of potentially having much wide, more widespread adoption is that we could own our own social graphs, right? So if I have the capacity to root you know, create an identifier for myself, or maybe many identifiers, I can, I can use, use my own software agent to connect to each of you separately. And then between us and our software, we're connected, we're not using another intermediary like Facebook or Twitter, or, you know, pick, you know, whatever, to be connected. So then we as a tribe of people who have our own agent rooted social connections could could travel to places that we like their services and in interacting on those in those places we're generating data but you know we're also running that all through our own agents that are also seeing the data that we're generating collectively so i think it has the potential to change the power dynamics with you know platforms and tools and services and it's not that we wouldn't use those but that our social graphs aren't owned by them, they're owned by us as a collective um, public good, which I believe they are. Our social relationships should not be owned by corporations. Um, <clears throat> so so that's, that's, that I think would be, go a long way to sort of creating some of the power that people need to engage in some of the strategies that we're talking about. And so how, how, what work is being done in that direction? Well, I mean, <clears throat> if we, we got really ambitious, I could pull out my Aries agent on my phone and we could exchange QR codes right here and we'd own our own social graph. Can we do a lot more than just message each other? No, but I mean, it's not, I'm not, I'm not hand waving and like, it's like the, the early prototypes are actually working. And, and so now it's how, how do we get, you know, um, meaningful applications that people love and drive adoption. So that's a direction like a way. So bypassing, creating our, our new social networks and our new social platforms. Right. Or, or ha having a way <clears throat> potentially like that we as a, you know, a community or a tribe of people that's socially connected through our own agents then showing up and saying, Oh, we're here provide us services, but it's, it's a different, it's a different power dynamic than us having our identifiers within those systems owned by those systems. So one uh, just thought that I have, Kalia, as, uh, and maybe you can sort of help my, my, I might just have sort of a naive perspective on this, but I've always thought that like so self-sovereign, doesn't self-sovereign, like, because I agree with what you're talking about, but doesn't it need like a rebrand or something? Because it, it, if you're talking about self-sovereign identity, but then you're, but then you're also you're talking about, you know, linkages between people, which sure. seems I, like look, intention with the idea of individual. I didn't sovereignty. come up with a name. I think yeah. there's a lot of problems for a variety of reasons. I mean, we could call it de decentralized identity. Um, it's a whole suite of sort of tools that can do a bunch of things. And so it's a, it's a, I don't want to say it's like, it's not, a, it's, you know, it's a little cluster of technologies that enable several different things. Um, so, you know, one of them is, you know, government issued, <laughs> government issued identity documents in my little identity wallet that it does that too. Um, so but it, but back to what I was saying, I think it is apt is that I have my agent and my identifiers and I'm connecting to your agent and your identifiers and we're not doing so through another piece of software that has the 
power to kill our digital representations of ourselves, which is what we have now. So, yeah, totally. Um, I I uh, I think that I think that the 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 vision is is uh, something is I, I resonates with me completely. Um, but uh, yeah, I just I've, I guess I've just always had this sort of uh, feeling that that there's a, a, a tension between what people who, you know, deeply understand self-sovereign identity are really talking about and yeah. what the, and, and what the words self and sovereign seem to imply. Sure. So I'm, I, you know, folks are watching or listening to this. If you want to come and help us free brand, I'm happy to have support that conversation happening. <laughs> I want to get to a couple of the questions because there are a lot of them. Uh, the one that's been upvoted the most is we know the problem and its effects, yet it is very theoretical. In practice, do we just delete Facebook, Twitch, etc.? Does anybody want to express what they're... Sorry, could you repeat the question? We know the problem and its effects, yet it's very the theoretical. In practice, do we just delete Facebook, etc., like all these platforms? Which, Kalia, it sounds a little bit like that might be with a temporarily branded self-sovereign identity, uh, your own OS, your own. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I would say go, you know, get, get, you know, get an agent. If you're a technical, start engaging with our communities and help pick up the Lego bricks that we've spent a lot of time working on standards to exist and build stuff. Um, in, you know, and I, I, you know, what should we do? I think, you know, you know, try Mastodon. It's an early, you know, it, it I don't know. I, 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 but I do think we can, I would say come and join the folks working on building the alternatives. Don't just abdicate from the existing tools. All right, I have some thoughts here. I'm kind of formulating them though, so they might be a wee bit hazy. Um, so first of all, I would say that yes, if there's a company, if there is a company whose practices that you don't believe in, um, deleting them or using their, so there's uh, one thing we talk about in, in some of our uh, data leverage work and data strikes work is that you can, there are middle grounds here. So it's not always, you don't have to delete things because uh, folks in, in human computer action research and, and computer supported cooperative work know that that's really hard. Just telling someone to delete Facebook is like not a, always too helpful. Like what if, you, what if Facebook is the only way you can talk to your grandmother? What if, you, what if you need Facebook to see when your like work posts updates about if they're gonna be closed because your boss is a bad communicator? Um, you know, what if you, you really like Facebook because your childhood friends on there? There's a lot of reasons that you wouldn't wanna quit Facebook and there's, there's more. Uh, and this is like, there's tons of rigorous research on the topic. Um, so just saying just quit Facebook isn't necessarily helpful, but saying like, oh, use it less, use technologies like Mozilla's Facebook container to that try to block Facebook when it tracks you on the web so that you only at least give them data on the facebook.com domain and not on other domains. Um, there's middle grounds. Uh, that being said, I think like a pretty, one thing that will be exciting to look for going forward is if there's more um, explicit demands around these things. So. There's been like, for instance, there was an Instagram boycott last September, I think, led by a bunch of celebrities that was called Stop a Hate for Profit, I think. It was, a, it was a hashtag, basically a form of hashtag activism. And it was related to Facebook um, profiting off uh, like hateful advertising, basically. And I, I don't know what the effects are. I mean, no one knows what the effects are except for uh, Facebook's you know, internal. But uh, things like that that are basically centered around a specific demand and kind of pick up traction which it, it's possible to do these in a disorganized manner as we've seen uh, on the internet. And uh, I, I think that more of that will be helpful. And I also want to just like uh, say that, that I, I'm not trying to be anti tech company and say that everyone should delete every app and certainly not say that like all machine learning is bad um, or that all tech is bad. And a big, a big thing I hear a lot is that I'll, I'll talk about this research at, you know, at conferences with a lot of representatives from tech companies or, um, folks who really like tech companies and I, I like tech companies. That's why I, I you know, study computer science. Um, and they'll say, oh, but you get so much, you get search is so good and you're getting so much free stuff. It, it can't be, what's wrong with this relationship? Why, why is there a problem? 
and to that, I would say that uh, it might be okay right now for some people, but the, the, the fact of the matter is that right now the relationship's really asymmetric and there's great potential for all these harms to become amplified in the future as uh, AI and, and data dependent technologies become more powerful. Um, and so that's why we should start worrying about it now. So we don't have to, I don't, I, I'm definitely not saying delete every app and like, you know, uh, every tech company is unequivocally bad. That's not at all uh, what we're trying to say. Um, but rather that in, uh, in uh, explicit, using explicit demands data leverage could start to change a lot of these relationships. That would maybe be how I'd frame it. I hope I didn't just incriminate myself. I mean, you can probably get some bad sound bites out of me uh, from that little spiel there, so. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who. Uh, I don't know which criminal authorities you're worried yeah. about, Nick. I, don't, <laughs> I think you're clean, though. The, uh, but um, I think that um, I, I really agree. I agree with what uh, both Nick and Kalia said. I, 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 in particular, agree that the best way to move things forward is to sort of is to engage with efforts to change the way things are working, whether those are, are uh, technical projects like what uh, Kalia is talking about or whether they're you know, activist projects like Radical Exchange um, or, or uh, you know, the, uh, work on, the kind of work on, on data leverage that, um, that, that Nick is doing. We just need to, um, we, it's entirely legitimate for us to ask for more. It's entirely, it's, it's, it's not only is it legitimate, it's, it's, it's correct. Like we're, we're not, um, we're not getting a fair deal. Uh, we're, we're all being, um, uh, getting the short end of the stick in our relationship with these, uh, with the big technology platforms. I don't, I don't really think there's any reason to mince words about that. Um, and, um, you know, you, you can, you know, obviously technology companies are publicly held technology companies and their job is to, um, is to serve their shareholders. But if you're not one of their shareholders, then that bargain isn't working out for you. Um, and um, uh, so I, I, I think we should, I think we should say this loud and clear frankly, and um, uh, I've been heartened in, in recent years that, that more people have, uh, have, have recognized, for example, the way, that, um, uh, the way that a lot of these business models are, are distorting our political discourse. Um, and, uh, but frankly, that's, that's just the, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's, a, there's sort of a very deep distortion of all kinds of social uh, social relations and um that are that are going on and uh the we need to become aware of it we need to we need to talk about it clearly and see it clearly as an issue and um uh uh name it and and demand better better policy and build you know activist movements and and technical projects that are addressing it One of the next questions is probably, well, it can be for all of us, but it's addressed to me. What role can artists play? And this is linked in my mind to that theoretical um, accusation earlier <laughs> and how we, how we speak about all these things. It is very theoretical. It is, um, you know, lots of different opinions and trying to distill these or one's own opinion into, if you're an artist, into a, a vision is extremely valuable and really needed at this time to try and see like, where can we go instead of just where, where are we going in this direction? I mean, we've been looking at, uh, I've said this for a while now, we've been looking at the worst case scenarios in you know, the public realm of visions and stories, films, um, or, or just completely devoid of any um, better world or a better vision of where we could go. And I think that's something that artists can do and just anybody in general can, can try and imagine where they want to go, what kind of world they want to live in um, and express that through stories and narratives, uh, 
paintings, whatever you want to, you know, films. Um, so that's my answer, as well as engaging the public, um, engaging your communities in creative ways and playful ways um, or educational ways. So that's what I think artists can do. As well as, I mean, I just think everybody has is can be creative and has an artistic streak if they have the time to play with it. So art in a way is kind of playing and we just need to play more in general on positive ways. And then the next one is um, decentralized ownership of data. How can we still ensure that the positive benefits of network data are utilized? Will there be an aggregator? Can I just say one more quick thing on yeah. uh, kind of from the last bridging the, the last topic for this one is I, I think another uh, thing is that um, part of what's so inspiring about Taiwan for the reason we talk about Taiwan so much is that they kind of provide a model of a of a society that is has struck us a little bit of a different uh, bargain in the in the relationship between technology and, and democracy and society. Um, and I think that, uh, that that shows that we can do better. We can, um, it, it's, it's, it's not a foregone conclusion that our relationship with, uh, with data, a relationship with technology needs to be, uh, needs to be a negative one, needs to be, you know, uh, exploitative and, and harmful to democracy. Um, we, we can, um, we can do a lot better, and there are these, you know, immense, immense positive uh, network effects that uh, that that come from these networks, and that can be and that can be harnessed to uh, make life better for a lot of people. Um, and um, so, uh, so yeah, we need to we need to do that. I mean, my, I, I have a, I have I've always had a very complicated relationship with like pessimism and optimism and utopianism and so like I, I, I think that uh, I um, uh, I think that we need to uh, we need to just see everything clearly we just need to see that there there are negative things going on and there are positive things going on and there could be a lot more positive things going on and, and try to uh, try to move towards that so anyway sorry positive network effects I think the, thanks, Matt. The um, yeah, the other question was, will there be an aggregator? So, in the decentralized ownership data of data situation, how can we ensure that the positive benefits of the networked data are utilized? Does anybody have? Yeah, I have some thoughts on this. Uh, can I answer this and then also briefly return to the? Yeah, 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 of course. Well, all right. So, really quickly. So, I have seen. Um, and this is not my area of expertise, but I've seen some exciting, uh, some buzz around basically using uh, some new technology. So for instance, the, the solid protocol is, is one thing. So I've, uh, there's a, a company, ITNI, who's working on building data unions, basically using uh, that protocol. I don't know the technical details, but uh, basically uh, it seems like there is pretty serious movement in this, in this direction. And I know there's other data unions. There's a bunch of uh, folks who have actual data unions uh, in the radical exchange, who are you know part of the radical exchange community, and um, they all, I, I think that they probably have some pretty concrete technical answers to that question as to how that would work. Um, generally speaking, I don't think that we need to like demolish. Like it's entirely possible that there could be a future where you have a choice whether you're going to do some sort of uh, decentralized uh, ownership versus I'm just going to keep using Facebook, but I'm happier with my bargain with them now because we were able to use data leverage to get them to change some of their practices we don't like. So this doesn't necessarily have to be a radical like deconstruction. Uh, it can be a gradual shift that involves basically, uh, you know, the, I think these things can coexist. That's my short answer. Uh, just on the previous question, I just did want to mention really quickly that there's a, a big problem right now is that I don't think that the academic research on the topic of, of data value and trying to measure data's value and whatnot is, is being communicated to the a broader audience all that well. And that's where like art really needs to play a role. So the, the theory of change that I guess that I take a lot in a lot of my work is that we, if we do research to measure the value of data using techniques from machine learning and computational social science and statistics, et cetera, and then we build tools to leverage that. So like a tool that helps you join a data strike, a tool that helps you do, build data poisoning. This is kind of like a one-two process for doing change, for, for making changes. Like a, I guess like a, 
simplified version. Um, but if you just make your results available in academic papers, uh, no one, no one will ever read it, and no one will ever know. Um, so it's it's really critical to like. I mean, I guess things like like activist organizations like Radical Exchange are, are doing a lot to maybe make these things known to a broader audience than would read academic papers. Um, but artists can do can probably beat that by an order of magnitude in terms of communicating messages around these things to an even broader audience and to uh, people who you know maybe don't like some people just don't want to get the message via a scientific paper um, and they might be much more open to getting the message via an artistic medium uh, so that, that's a place where I think that like the academics need help desperately uh, they need help very desperately on this front so hopeful I'm hopeful for that so yeah sorry those are my two answers real quick <laughs> thanks Leah, do you have any any thoughts about that? I mean, I think we'll see. I mean, like I said, I think that there's it's not all one or the other, right? Like if I if if me and a group of folks who are leveraging a service, we can own our social graph and still be using the service and they can still be, you know, generating data off of our usage of it, right? Um I think um I think, you know, and there, there are, there are, there are ideas about um, sort of communities and networks connecting together. If folks are interested, I'd recommend connecting to the My Data community that's working with entrepreneurs, building tools for people to collect and manage their own data. And if you're really nerdy, you can join me on the, I co-chair the Secure Data Store Working Group, and we're working on a specification for um, confidential data stores. Um, that hopefully will standardize all, all this so that you could take your data from one, <clears throat> one provider to another with no switching, well, not no switching costs, but very low switching costs because there's an open standard that defines how to do it. Interesting. So we have five, well, six minutes left. Uh, I'm really curious about um, two questions. So I think we've kind of come to understanding from this talk that there's certain agency as an individual and definitely will have agency as sharing, data agency with shared um, focus. What, what do you see about the conflict? So we're kind of like in this direction of almost going to like a space war with AI with between the US and China. And there's this, I think in China, there's a sense that it is shared and there's like the social credit score and there's lots of people, there's a very different cultural approach to um, data and its uses and AI and technology that in the US, it's, it is a little bit more individualized and we're probably standing in our own way. Um, but do you, think, do you think that this ultimately, this kind of competition with AI is detrimental to us being able to, between countries, do you think we're gonna eventually get to that as a problem with this individual versus shared or the, the true benefits that we could get from data and us contributing that to this system that ultimately we're gonna come up to this, this wall that's going to, or that that's gonna underlie like the foundation of a lot of problems. I'm not sure if I'm making myself very clear, but as I, I'm a bit worried about this space race type of thing with AI and that that's going to conflict with us finding true potential and fair, um, fair game for shared, not fair game, but like fair uses of data and it going to the right place. Is that, is that kind of clear? Yeah, I have nodding. a quick thought on that, <laughs> which is that I think it's, I think it's pretty uh, task dependent. Like I think it might be useful to like kind of look at the different races, like specific to the actual like AI tasks that you're talking about. Because for instance, for targeted advertising, I don't think that the world is I don't think we desperately need the top tech firms in the US and the top tech firms in China to share their um, training data to create the ultimate global targeted advertising model. 
I, I don't think that will the human you know humanity will gain utility uh, from that happening, and in fact, may gain negative utility. The same can be said about a lot of other AI technologies. So facial recognition is one that the researchers in that area have found that there's a lot of cases where it, it's just it can't be used without without harm, or it tends to produce more harm than it does uh, good for the world. Uh, so for basically all these cases where there's these technologies, uh, credit scoring, psychometric profiling uh, are a couple other examples that uh, maybe maybe you can find some ways to use them for good, but oftentimes they they not for good. Uh, so for these things, we don't really even want the governments of the world necessarily, uh, you know, merging their heads together and creating this ultimate AI to produce even more harm than a single government can do right now. On the other hand, for like military applications, I think the space race analogy uh, is maybe a little more accurate and a lot more concerning. Um, Another nice thing is just the diminishing returns mean that uh, basically each company's like AI performance is probably pretty close to the diminishing returns mark already, right? If we already, if the U.S. has 99% and China has 99% accuracy on some task, uh, it, it doesn't particularly matter if they merge. I mean, they might there might be uh, you know geographic specific effects where if it's uh, detecting trees or doing uh, things moving around the world, um, you need training data from the particular region that you want your technology to operate in. Uh, but in general, yeah, I, I guess so. My short answer is that it's really task dependent. And for a lot of tasks, it's actually we don't want the governments of the world to merge their heads together, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. OK, I see. Uh, one more minute. I don't know. I think that's probably it might just change in the hour, the half hour right now. Do you want to all end with a last thought or individual versus shared? <laughs> Any last um, comments? Both. Both. Thank you. <laughs> Do we all agree? Thank you for your time. And thanks for everybody for joining. I hope this uh, answered some of your questions, individual versus shared, and that we, we think it's both. Um, and please reach out, join Radical Exchange, uh, get involved, or join um, also Kalia has these identity workshops. Get in touch with Kalia when you want to um, learn more about self-sovereign identity as long as it's named that for now um we'll be posting also nick your paper the you said the data dividend.com a uh, data dividends.org data dividends.org please go visit that so you can read what was recently published and thank you all very much see you soon